welcome to another guitar show. This is a Q&A special. We are answering all of your guitar related questions that were posted on my Instagram a couple of days ago. Some of these are going to be quick fire and then we're going to dig into some of the meatier topics. Mm -hmm. Um, bit of music theory, a bit of should you, uh, do you need to read guitar music, do you need to be able to read traditional notation and every other small question that you can think of. We, to help us do that, we have the help of producer Chris. Say hello producer Chris. Yay. Hello. Say hello, there he is, hello. he has a voice as well. <laughs> the usually silent Chris who's always here making sure the cameras are turned on and uh, doing all the focusing and all the technical stuff and we just sit in and play guitar and talk We guitar. definitely don't focus on It's right. easier, yeah, we don't focus on anything. <laughs> but we're going to have two or three quick fire questions starting with. Chris, take it away. Okay, so the first question is, do you play bass? Do you play bass, Thomas? I do play bass and as a moment for a little quick uh, <laughs> um, plug, I'll be playing bass for Paul Gilbert at our... Mamaru, Birmingham, 2nd of April. He's good. We'll He's be there. I'll be there too. It's like I've done this before. He's professional. Um, and yeah, Paul Gilbert Masterclass is going to be superb. We hope to see you there. I have played bass before, literally just to be able to make the band I was in function because the bass player left or one of those. You're the tall guy, aren't you? So tall guys play the bass, really. You've got all the wingspan for it. Apparently, yeah, that's that's one reason. The other reason is the bass player left. I think he left his bass at the practice rooms for a while as well, so I used his bass. That's exactly the same way that I became a singer as well. Singer left. I sang the songs so that we could just rehearse. But you, you kind of, I, I'm a guitarist that also yeah. plays bass. Typically with a pick, I can't do anything to it. It is a very different instrument mm -hmm. bass, but as I guitar players... We can often um, make jokes about it because, yeah. Uh, yeah, it's it's the low notes, the bit no one really listens no. to. That's the running joke with bass players. Next question, <laughs> okay. quick fire. Okay, next question. Do I really need to learn how to read sheet music? Okay, I think this is going to be one of the longer ones. Or maybe, I think there was a couple of the theory questions no, there. No. Um, so... What is your answer to that? Do you re do you really do no. you really need to learn to be? Most of my favorite no. guitar players and my favorite bands they can't sight read music. By which we mean taking the notes on the page of traditional manuscripts, mm -hmm. ones with the dots on, no no numbers, no tab or anything like that. We're talking dots on the page, crotchets, quavers, semi quavers, demi semi quavers, yeah. rests, all of this kind of things. Um, bass clef was always a particular struggle for me. It was always a, a tough one. Treble clef I could read fine. I could never get, because I learnt piano first, I could never um, sight read both at the same time on a fresh piece of music. Yeah. I would always be read it first and then be reading the bit that I needed to, needed I, to learn. I mean, Many guitar <coughs> players, and I would go as far as say most guitar players, they, yeah. never learn to sight read as in, here's a new piece of music and having, having to play it. Um, things that are very good to borrow from that side of thing, though, to, from the traditional music, are things like rhythm, yeah. knowing crotchets, quavers, and just how, um, how, it will, how music will be written in a bar, mm -hmm. which means that every note, when it's written in, in the bar, has to add up to the, to the rhythm of that bar, so four beats to a bar, it has to add up to four. That kind of thing is really useful to know. A lot of that can be learned through technology and using uh, MIDI and things yeah. like that. So a lot of those same things can be learned elsewhere and not, again, not having to sight read. Mm -hmm. I think that ability to sight read and having to learn everything by that method is one thing that puts a lot of people off from learning music and learning guitar in particular yeah. or piano lessons get the worst rap for that I think yeah. because it's just it's a everyone, bit more like that in piano isn't it everybody seems to feel that if that's the, the proper way to learn an instrument and learn piano yeah, I'm not you can't that. get through that it's past not, that dull stage really and it's, it's not you know it's not the 1800s anymore it's we've, true we've got technology really written music is a way of, of um, showing people how to play something but we've exactly. got audio files so you can stop and you can listen and you can slow it down and which they didn't yeah. have when music was being yeah, written exactly. down originally it was the only way and now there are frankly better ways of communicating a lot of the same There's things certainly easier ways um again there are a lot of things to take from it there are things that are written on the page that can be heard as well but to know about it 
things like um, how loud or quiet to play something, that kind of thing. But yes, I think we'll cover a co another couple of questions on music theory later. Mm -hmm. So another quick fire one, Chris. Okay, quick question. Les Paul or Strat? Les Paul? Strat. There oh, you simple. <laughs> <laughs> you own a Les Paul though. I own a Strat as well. Well, to be honest. So I've why got, would you instinctively well, say Strat? Strat just, the Strat to Les Paul ratio is two to one. Okay. So I, I just the Les Paul does a Les Paul and a Strat is more versatile, I think. I would agree, especially on recording as well. I think a lot yeah. of players um, use Strats in the studio that would use other guitars live. Yeah. Um, because of that versatility and because the sometimes you, you usually want things to sound a little cleaner on the recording yeah. and everyone plays a little bit heavier live. Um, but yeah, Les Paul. Next question. Who is your favourite band? Uh, I have two. Okay. So my personal favourite bands are, are Foo Fighters and The Darkness, but they're for two very different reasons. You can... It, it, Dave Grohl has been in the two biggest bands or two of the biggest yeah, bands of all time or he's been in the biggest band in the world twice <laughs> <laughs> that is just incredible and i just i have such a love for that throughout the years but another favorite band of mine is called the darkness because they were the biggest band in the world in 2003 and that was when I was, that was the year that I put the most practice like in. like a year, weren't they? And then they just kind of... Yeah, absolutely. Um, but also, there's a lot about their story that I yeah. relate to. The fact that they were sort of ignored by the industry. They spent their own money recording their debut album. Mm -hmm. And then it became massive, so... They're really fun as well. Yeah, it They're was very different to a lot cheek, of other... They? There were a lot of... A lot of reasons why they seem like they came from another planet. Yeah. I was learning a lot of classic rock songs then as well, and it was all from like 20 or 30 years ago, mm -hmm. and they were so now. That wouldn't apply to someone who is just getting into music now, but for me, yeah. you know, they, they were the biggest band in the world when I was around 16 or something, mm -hmm. so that's why. I was, uh, this may, may kind of connect some things, Steely Dan. Wow, okay. Yeah, just masterful, masterful composers. The yeah, music's a little in bit these. complete. Um, yes, that was them, right? Oh, I don't, yeah, they wouldn't like you. That, <laughs> they wouldn't like you. That's the, you know, if that was never not heard a good them, impression. If you've never heard of them, um, really, it's some, it's pop music with, with jazz in it, with blues, with some kind of Latin influences. And it's just so unique. Give, give people one Steely Dan song to say, if you've never heard of them before and you want people to get into them or see what you like about them uh -huh. with one song. It would be, ooh, Deacon Blues. Yeah? Deacon Blues. Cool. Um, amazing, but all of it's absolutely incredible music. Very cool. Next question. Um, next question is, what is your favorite song to play on the guitar? That changes a lot, but one <laughs> of the, as, as is, you know, that's, yeah, it does. that's just being honest, but one, that I, one or two that I always come back to, one's High and Dry by Radiohead on acoustic guitar, because I think I play it particularly well for a sort of open mic night or gig style vibe. So if I had to play a cover and I'm suddenly in a room that, where no one's heard me play before and it's like, what does this guy do? I will normally play high and dry and I really enjoy it as well. Mm -hmm. Safe Tonight as well by Eagle Eyed Cherry. Belt in tune to play at open mic nights <laughs> or in a group of people who are like, who are you? What do you play? Uh, what do you do? Play one of those two tunes yeah. and you'll, you'll go down well. What about yourself? I don't know. I don't think I really have like a favorite tune to play. I just Quick like... fire round, Thomas. Quick fire round. You've got to make a decision. Oh God, this is not going to be quick. Let's cut. <laughs> um, we're, as, we're asking Thomas you're to asking name the, songs again. Yeah, you're asking <laughs> the wrong person. <laughs> There's nothing question. quick about it. To be honest, this. Andy was playing a John Mayer riff earlier. Yeah. And that is a really fun riff. Good Love is on the way. Great riff. Absolute tune. So um, I'm going to go with that. Or pick a John Mayer song for you, really, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, a John Mayer song. Um, next question. Okay, so... This says, how many guitars do you have and why? So I guess, how many guitars do you have and why do you have so many or so few? Okay. Seven. And in some respects, I have seven because as a guitar player, you tend to collect more guitars than you get rid of. Mm -hmm. You find reason to keep them. 
then we're all guilty of that for sure. Yep. But also, um, uh, well, you, you answer the question and then we'll discuss why perhaps more on the electric guitar side yeah. we might choose to Definitely. have more than one guitar. Well, it's the same, actually. I've got seven. Magic number. Um, J.K. Rowling. You have both a Les Paul and a Strat, for example. Yes. Why? Because I think that's the classic that's a, example. It, they just do and sound very unique and very different, but there's some stuff that just you can't really use a Strat for, like the heavier rock stuff. The Strat just doesn't quite have that power. But it's just it. not a tone that you're going oh, for. Oh, the tone even. And the, the Strat and the Les Paul give you the two sides that yes. you typically want They're to be able to recreate. The most kind of used. You can create a lot of other sounds that are similar to a Les Paul. Same with a Strat, but they can't quite do each other. Yeah. And uh, when you're using a better amp, or when you're using any amplifier really, the key to getting a great tone out of it is to be putting the right thing into it in the first place. And that can be as simple as single coils or humbuckers, which are the two main types of pickup. Um, but also just the, the type of guitar can somewhat dictate what tone you're, you're going to mm -hmm. get. And some riffs are just kind of, what, what would you think is a classic Strat riff? Um, something like Basically. Under the Bridge or anything yeah. by anything by the Chili Peppers, oh, really. Hendrixy kind of stuff as well. And then, you know, a classic um, humbucker riff is kind of anything by ACDC yeah. or, or anything where you've got that kind of power like chord sweet, sound. Sweet, 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 a sweet child of mine. Yeah, exactly. Even that kind of thing, that thickness that, to the sound. Um, and you're never, you're never going to get that exactly. Even if you dial in the Guns N' Roses setting on your amplifier that claims <laughs> that it does that, yeah. that is only going to work if you put the right thing into it. You get out of an amplifier what you put mm. into it. So that's our excuse. <laughs> yeah. From there, there are so many super personal things as well from yeah. a guitar, preferring one other, uh, one neck, one brand, but then not wanting to. That's the great thing about electric guitar, actually. There's such a range of tone, even from the same guitar. Yeah which is a lot less for acoustic, but I've got a couple of acoustics as well. Yeah, you tend to have very few, well, not very few, but much fewer acoustics than you have electric guitars. It's, it's true. Um, yeah, next question. Okay, so this is a, a playing one. Um, is there an easy way to play the F chord without barring? Yes. Can you think of any particular ways? Because this is a, something I've done a lot. Yeah, so what are your I've favorite? got, well, Without any Do you want to sit up slightly so we can get oh, the close-up yeah. camera a little better? Relax a little bit too much. <laughs> Without any barring at all, yeah. I would go for either this or with that pinky note in there as well. So it's almost the same shape <clears> as the bar, just taking some of these notes away, which I talk about a lot. It's within there. It's and just that, that is what I would encourage as well. So we've got go the easy at F major 7, which is I call F like a C. You do. But it, then if then we use the third and little finger, creating that E major shape. We're still not barring, but the middle four strings are all playing an actual yeah. F chord. It's not an easier or cheating F. You know, if you just play those middle four strings, and, and a lot of the bar chord is actually training fingers two, three, and four to be a bit more yeah. independent. And then you can work towards doing the bar, or we can do uh, what bar. I call a mini bar, yeah, yeah. <laughs> which is a bit rock and roll. Um, so you've got the first finger then just um, barring just the thinnest two strings, keeping on the side of the first finger, keeping the elbow in. Thumb can play this note or doesn't have to, it can mute. Either way, either the thinnest five strings, or all six strings if you hold down with the thumb, which again can be why some people prefer some guitars to others. A Strat has quite a um, big scale length, so your frets will actually be wider yeah. than this guitar. This has a very short scale length, which means the length of it is shorter, but therefore all the frets are closer together mm -hmm. as well. So it's a lot easier to do that kind of chord yeah. on a guitar with a shorter scale length than it is on something like a Strat. But if you get used to doing that, very handy to change to the C chord, very handy to work towards playing bar chords, and you can even do that on any chord, not just the F yeah. chord. My favourite major... is a bit of a mix of the two with the thumb, and then sometimes you can get that. It's nice to have the high note in there, like the Hendrix thing. Absolutely. And it does, you know, these are easier cheats for, yeah. you know, beginners to use, but lead on to a lot of yeah. kind of lead guitar Hendrix style little riffs. Mm -hmm. Tune into more episodes of Another Guitar Show <laughs> to see that kind of thing. Next question, Chris. Okay, so another playing one. 
how to change chords without messing up or stopping your strumming. Okay, I have one tip that I could give on that one, uh -huh. and then I want to know your example probably for another little riff or situation. Uh -huh. But there's one great thing that um, everybody does and beginners need to know about, which is especially when you have, say, an eighth strumming pattern, so a one and two and three and four and, typically on that last up strum, that is your cue to make sure you're lifting off of that, that chord and getting down for the next one. So if we want to go for the tricky change of a C to an F when we need a little bit of time to change, one and two and three and four lift and in context even if you lifted off all fingers but also what you're trying to do for example between that C and the F that we learned earlier the third finger doesn't have to move so also being aware if any fingers can stay down, uh, what we can call an anchor finger or a pivot finger. Um, there's another one between the D chord and the G chord like this where that third finger again stays down. And of course that's where I would start with my beginner lessons with the easiest two chords I would say um, that we can play a lot of songs with which are the E chord and the A chord and that first finger kind of stays down and we pivot around it but again actually lifting off on the last up strum that mm -hmm. you do and that's presuming that we're getting down um, again for beat one. Do you have an example or anything just helping yeah, change chord so, really? Um, I mean that for the open chords that's the exact type of thing I would talk about. So with bar chords mm -hmm. we can take it to there then you know it's really this motion all the time so if you can practice cleanly moving mm -hmm. the bar and even just even just that spying you know the fret that you're going to move to yeah, and then exactly. moving to it and you'll can get you get that getting that clear sound and then you just think of it as two components so there's that component and then there's whatever your fingers are doing can you practice moving almost like an e to an a yeah practicing open these? chords e and a just with your three weaker fingers uh -huh. that that always uh makes makes people really yeah. really reassess what they're doing with their fingers but it's that exact same thing to change you know between any bar chord it's it's the, it's the same skill and you know the first finger bar and then what the uh -huh. second third and fingers and then even if we're talking about moving bar chords like so where maybe G to a D again it's just both of those components that motion and this motion and then you practice put them together mm -hmm. and with bar chords bar chords may be seen as harder to play yeah but for coordination with strumming hand it's kind of easier because the strumming hand is just always kind of going away like the one and two and three and four that we were doing before it's much easier to and it's actually it, yeah. this hand that that can be doing a lot work. of the work So there the rhythm is being created by me relaxing this hand and the strumming hand is always just doing that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. um, plenty of songs do that, plenty of Jason Mraz songs, plenty of Jack Johnson songs do exactly that kind of thing. Strumming hands always hitting all the strings all the time. It's not about the D's and U's with your strumming. It's not about, is it down, up, down, up, down. The strumming hand's always moving and you're choosing what rhythm to hit. Yeah. That would be the focus and the change that I would do. But this is a and a episode, so we'll move on from there. <laughs> Next question, Chris. Okay, so we've slightly covered this, but which artists were most influential on you when you started playing guitar? When I first started playing guitar, you'd have to say the Beatles because I definitely had a Beatles songbook when I first started. Yeah. Too many other people have as well for it to not be a place to start. And it's kind of like, how does this guitar thing work? Okay, literally working out how song sheets work from seeing the chord over a certain word, knowing how the song goes a little bit and just strumming once on each word. Mm -hmm. um, and it would be kind of mad to say that that wouldn't be massively influential, really. What about you? Uh, at, from the very start, it was a, just a bit of a mix, lots of different things. And then when I kind of started to hone in 
I suppose I fell kind of in that Jimi Hendrix, Steve Ray Vaughan mm-hmm. school there, kind of from the same general way of playing. So I think it was them. It was my most That wasn't exposed to me through like family or anything. It was through another kid who played guitar at school. Yeah. And then I think we shared the same, um, he had one air guitar album. Remember mm-hmm. the Brian May one? Yes. Um, and then I had another one and we swapped them and that was kind of like, oh, I'll just learn these songs yeah. and then I'll probably be able to play something on guitar. And uh, yeah, really, really mm-hmm. was. The, those air guitar al- albums were really influential. Again, oh. out around 2001, 2002. Yeah. Um, it was only after 2002 that we started to get guitar music back. Yeah, it was. Remember, really guitar music went away around 1999. A dark time. It, it genuinely was, especially after Britpop and stuff. Well, it's kind of, yeah, it's popped off a bit so now. So, yeah, again. there you go. Next quick fire question, Chris. Okay, so after basic chords and open chords, what's next? What's next? Very good question. Um, I would suggest some single note playing, minor pentatonic scale and major scale. Mm-hmm. So this is presuming that what you've, what the student has learned so far is open chords and strumming songs, and then they've learned how to do that skill with, with bar chords to some degree. Mm-hmm. Um, I would make sure that that student can play a full song along to the recording before worrying too much about picking any single notes or playing it. But I introduced that like lesson one, yeah. and I know not everyone does, but I really want a student who can strum open chords and strum bar chords to be able to play along to full song, which is understanding song structure. Mm-hmm. And trying to do that as well without having to just follow your, your chord sheet. Being able to memorize a sequence and being like, I'm okay with these. But at some point, minor pentatonic scale and the major scale. Mm-hmm. That would be my suggestion. What do you think? I'm going to take the question from a slightly different approach. So what Andy said, if you meant it in terms of, well, what do I, if I'm going from not, once I've got these basic things, what should I do? I'm going to take it from the approach of once I've learned these chords, what chords should I learn next? Just Yeah, yeah, um, sure. Well, I would say seventh chords. So each of the oh, yeah, cage yeah. shapes will all have seventh chord variations, minor seven, major seven, dominant seven. Uh, so Sus as well. Sus, sus as well. Chords. Go and try and learn those and move them into bar chords if that's the kind of type of question you framed there. Yeah, of course. So if you have, say, a D chord, we have the D and D minor. D minor. Bar chords, ways of playing that. Mm-hmm. But then also you have the D, D major, major seven, seven, D dominant seven. seven. And then the minor seven. Same thing with the, the bar versions as well. Uh-huh. Yeah, sticking on just chord knowledge, I think that's, yeah, um, if, that's fair yeah, enough. That's what I would say for that. Absolutely, good answer. I think we've got a longer question now, something a bit meatier. Okay, so Josh Green has said, where to start with music theory? Where to start with music yeah. theory? Uh, we've discussed this, I think, on a previous episode where we would say that our... Uh, the most essential piece of music theory that a guitarist needs to know is about musical keys, diatonic chords, which chords go together, and how and why does a scale go over that. So we've done a full episode um, of another guitar show on that, which we will link to in the description below. Um, But are there any other bits of music theory which stand out to you as really essential, other than chords in a key? Maybe learning the series of notes or the series of intervals for the major scale. Yeah. So that you can do it on one scale up Mm -hmm. and you can hear that. So so tone, 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 semitone, tone, 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 semitone. That kind of thing. That would be quite important because that major major scale is the fundamental building block basically of And the chords in a key is also based off of the same major scale harmony. Mm -hmm. So seeing that link there. Uh, Also rhythms, how rhythms can be written. Yeah, that's being able to emulate or or come up with a a rhythm and have it have it work. Yeah, you know, understanding beats in a bar. Beats, yeah, exactly. Absolutely. You know, there's a lot of music theory there, but we don't think about it as music theory because. We don't always see it written down. As I say, a lot of you guys yeah. can think about this as the downs and ups. Do you, you, yeah, exactly. you know, and you think about it exactly. like that. But do you understand how long each of those lasts for mm-hmm. and where the beat falls, which it's, is the most important I would actually thing. say, yeah, that is Andy's answer to best there. Understanding of rhythm and... Which is often, it's often overlooked. But rhythm, difficult. 
Rhythm, rhythm is somewhat more important than the notes that you play. It can mm -hmm. take precedence. You can play bum notes throughout a riff, but if the rhythm and muting is sound, you can get away with yeah, it. Definitely. If your rhythm's off, it's going to sound bad to everyone and, and straight away. And understanding. And there's no masking it. No, there's not. And an understanding of it just helps you learn more things. Faster and it faster does, yeah, and yeah. It just glues everything. It together. doesn't want to rhythm. Doesn't want to be the thing that slows you down, and it no. can be very um, uh, a great way to get used to improving your rhythm is um, using MIDI and using sequences, yeah. using Garage Band. So either creating rhythms from that or recording yourself and listening to it back mm -hmm. and uh, trying trying to go from there. Um, do we have a related question on music theory? We do indeed. Okay. Um, so one. do I need to learn? guitar theory to become a great player or music theory to become a great player do i need to learn music theory to be a great player to some degree yes mm -hmm. but the things that you don't need to know to be a great player are sight reading ability of traditional notation with a treble clef and a bass clef and and being able to sight read that um i know it's, uh, the biggest thing that i want to say with regards to that is the uh, E note be above middle C, so two notes above middle C, which would be one note on a piano and one note on a stave, um, is actually playable in five different positions yeah. on so a guitar. All of those, I don't actually have enough frets to play the last <laughs> one, but even on this smaller scale guitar, one, two, three, four, and Five, if I kind of bend that note up, <laughs> yeah. but you're, on Me your too. guitar it's five places, uh -huh. um, so it's actually not as effective uh, at communicating what what is played. Tab is more effective, but tab often lacks rhythm. So the, as a, as we've sort of repeating the phrase that rhythm is so important, understanding and being able to replicate rhythms. And that is something that is actually part of music theory that's mm -hmm. often overlooked and, and people need to learn. It was actually a slip of the tongue there that gave me an idea of Chris. He said guitar theory, but then corrected himself to music theory. I thought that's, ah, that's interesting. true. Yeah, yeah. Guitar theory in terms of I guess the a lot of, of boxes and stuff. Yeah, like that. I guess I guess when you say guitar theory, you would be saying fret boxes, cage systems, yes, all that kind all of All that transposing just through moving shapes. I think that's really useful. Yeah. It goes you, back to the diatonic thing. You can get a long way with that and I think most guitar players tend to learn as much as they can through songs. Yeah. You want to be able to play that song or you want to be able to play guitar like a certain band or guitar player and you try and learn just their songs mm -hmm. and you see how far you can get and a lot of people come up way short because because um, it's difficult and it's that song or that player is presuming prior knowledge or has that yeah. prior knowledge but then the student can't doesn't, doesn't know what else to try exactly. and how to get there doesn't know the building blocks and the way where you can really get the most out of the songs that you learn is try and spot those building blocks if you learn a riff try and figure out what scale it is or research what scale or mm -hmm. key it's in and learn all of that scale or learn, learn all of those notes in that or chords in that key learn how the guitar player solos over that riff or that song and what scale that's using what rhythms is it using and um, and the traits of that genre mm -hmm. and if you do that you can spend most of your time learning songs and you're already learning the music theory yeah. along with it. But you can see how we're, we're pulling things back to the rhythm, the scale, the key. Mm -hmm. All of those things are absolutely music theory and guitar theory, but they're not reading the notes on the page. No. Because that is not the priority for most guitar players. No, I would say. All. Next question, can we have a quick fire one, please, Chris? Okay, so... How to practice lead guitar in time? Some tips. I'm assuming that means musical timing. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Let's not go too existential. Yeah, that goes. <laughs> <laughs> what is time? Oh. What is time? Um, so practicing in time. I've heard you say that you've done a, a lot of work and you encourage a lot of work with a metronome. Mm -hmm which would be definitely the thing that we would be encouraging if you're wanting to improve your timing. I would add to that that if you're playing to a metronome already, you may as well record yourself and perhaps use some music software like mm -hmm. GarageBand or Logic or whatever you happen to have 
something where you can play to a metronome but record yourself as well and then perhaps see it afterwards yes. and have the visual um, clue as to the rhythm um, as well as just, just the listening because you, I, th I think you, with timing and, and a lot of the phrasing that we've talked about um, in previous episodes, lead guitar phrasing and things, you need to be able to hear it back because it's like hearing back your own speaking voice on an answering machine <laughs> yeah. or something when everybody, when they hear their own speaking voice back, goes, oh, oh, I yeah. don't, they wince. I, I don't sound like that, do I? Trust me, we see ourselves on camera all the time and we, we can't believe yeah. what, uh, what we sound That's like or say way. sometimes. So it's that same thing with your playing, though. You don't realize how, what mistakes you might be making unless you listen to them back and then they get corrected because you've given yourself that perspective. Yeah. What so um, exercises would you have to improve rhythm and time in working to a metronome? I would thing? just quickly add, it almost goes back to something you said, that understanding of the rhythm, like mm. that, this note that I'm hearing, or I, it's meant to be a beat. Am I playing it? That's on the beat and it right. lasts this long. So we need, you need and to And the mutes as well, the mutes have to be a certain yeah, amount they, of time everything is in time whether it's silence or notes mm -hmm. it's all in time it's all a written value mm -hmm. um so understanding that is really quite very well i should say very useful in but what exercises will we have for people so i mean let's take something as simple as playing a pentatonic scale mm -hmm. in time can you do it in quarter notes one two three four then move to eighth notes one and two and three and four and and just kind of going down that route, can you change that rhythm in the middle of the song, let's say, or not middle of the song, say a bar of quarter notes followed by a bar of eighth notes. One, two, three, four, one. So the main beat didn't change. Which is exactly the same kind of exercise I'd be giving people who are struggling with their strumming, especially with, with rhythm and timing. Mm -hmm. Strumming on the beat. Yeah. Strumming eights. One. And then maybe we're strumming sixteenths as well, but the beat still remains consistent throughout. Yep. A lot of that kind of rhythm content, I think, should be learnt with chords first for most players, because there's a little bit less to worry. As soon as people yeah, have to play this note, which is in the middle of all these six strings, which seems like a complete maze, and you play that, and then you have to get the rhythm right, mm. it can be too much at once. So rhythm guitar in my opinion, kind of comes first and should come first, even if you want to play like Slash, even if you want to play all the lead stuff, get your rhythm and get the riffs there first, because then when you learn lead, you've got a lot of the skills needed already mm -hmm. and we don't have to worry too much about the rhythm. Mm -hmm. Just uh, need, one suggestion, yeah, one school of thought. You need to know where the rests and the mutes are as well. Mm -hmm. So if I took that same thing I did, could you pick out and say, I'm, <coughs> going, to, I'm going to rest on the third eighth note of the bar or something well let, let's let's take it much more applicable than that and say uh you've taught a solo to one of your students mm -hmm. i had this a lot where they would play the solo and over the actual song or the backing track and they pretty much be, be able to uh the so the, they'd be playing the solo ahead of the beat because yes. they have no concept of the timing yeah. of it and even though they're playing along to the real solo it's just like they're finishing it as soon as they can yeah they're just trying to get to the end of it because they're like i think i know all these notes and it's like you're actually it's a good thing because the student you can tell the student you're actually playing too fast there yeah exactly. everyone wants to be able to play faster so you're actually almost giving them a compliment mm -hmm. but you got to say that, look, unless your rhythm is correct and the timing is correct, you might play all the notes right, but the, the solo's wrong. It's, yeah. And it's the biggest thing that's considered wrong more than a wrong note. Yes. Um, particularly when lead guitarists are starting to play in bands and stuff and they lose that safety net of a backing track or, you, you know, the, the cue of where yeah, their where, next where part of a solo is. Exactly. So, uh, yeah, there's a lot of tips on rhythm and timing. Do we have any questions left? We should have one or two, yeah. maybe? Okay, so finally, we've got two questions on sort of ear training. Um, the first is how to recognize notes just by hearing it. Um, and then there's another question, which is how to train your ears and how to create your own melodies. Mm -hmm. um, so let's talk about it from a rhythm point of view first. Do you hear a song? and you want to be able to strum it as, as soon as possible. If you're actually working out songs by ear, you start off with an element of randomness. Mm -hmm. you, 
if no, knowing what the chords are in terms of diatonic harmony and things that we, you know, is that the one chord, is that the four chord? That's quite easy to hear yeah. and quite trainable. Cadences would be the biggest yeah, thing I would exactly. say to be learning and, and uh, being familiar with first of all, which is how sort of a, uh, a, a chord sequence resolves. But that I think what I want to tell people here is that being able to hear a note or a chord and be able to say that is a C major chord, that is a D major chord, that is incredibly difficult and something that takes years of training. Being able to hear a C chord and then you have a guitar in front of you and you work out what chord it is by playing numerous chords and then going, ah, now that know. chord sounds like that. Or trying the first chord and going, it's a little bit higher than that. And sort of, again, a little bit of educated guessing is very much more learnable, much quicker, can seem so scary. Mm. But once you find, and, and I would start personally, let's have a go now. You, so you just play any chord. Please make it a bar chord just for the purpose sure. of this exercise. But just play a chord. Okay, so what I'm going to go for first of all is find that, mm, the lowest note I can hear. Okay, so that note is a C sharp. Is the chord at least got a root note of a C sharp? It does. Okay, so I'm then, I think it's a major chord because it sounds happy, it doesn't sound sad. But that sounds a little bit kind of too happy in the chord you played. Sounded a bit more interesting than that. So uh, I can't really play the chord that I want to play in this position, so I'm going to put it to the fourth fret here and go for this shape. There we go. Play yours again? Yep. Okay. So the type of chord I got quite quickly, it's a major seven chord, but I didn't know, I, there was no, no I, I, I had no frame of reference mm -hmm. and my ears aren't warmed up yet or I wasn't able to say C sharp. If I'd have played a song that was just in C sharp yeah. and then you'd have played that chord, I'd have probably gone, that's a C sharp yeah, exactly. But I didn't have that point of reference. So this was how I worked out that first you know, chord. And it's, it's called, so there's perfect pitch which has been able to hear a note and go, that is... F. Not only a note, the whole chord the as whole well, chord. really. And then there's relative pitch, being able to hear what the movement is, but not necessarily the exact notes. That sounds like a one to a five. And that, that's the thing to work that's on. That's much more applicable. Mm. I mean, it's... It's, if you it's can more attainable tell, as exactly, well. Exactly. If you can tell that this note is a G without, that's great. But, you know, it's not really that necessary because if you can train your understanding of diatonic theory hmm. and then your relative pitch one like you said it's much easier um but it's it's essentially the same thing it might take a little bit longer so le again learning learn about it. the theory of diatonic chords but also what those chords sound like relative mm -hmm. to each other learning to hear the one four five learning about cadences is how you will learn to be able to work out rhythm lines, mm -hmm. chord lines, that kind of thing. To finish up, how can we possibly do that with a lead guitar solo? So mm -hmm. we have a solo, we have a Guns N' Roses solo or something that we want to learn. What would your process be? Of figuring out what the solo was. Yeah, is the one that you've worked out recently or anything? Um, It'd be hard to give an example, especially as soon as I'm on uh, acoustic. There was, there was actually, and it was a Steely Dan solo. Okay. Um, so it's a little bit intricate, but, um, you know, I would hear the note, I would hear, or I would figure out the chords it was under, so I could get yeah, yeah. a line of, this is the, this is the, this is the key, the key, yeah. all that, the same old stuff, this is the key, right, now I've got my frame of reference, I know the general notes it's going to be using, and then I would just listen to it, play a phrase, stop it, and then go, okay, what's that note, mm -hmm, pitch it. Pause it, freeze it in your mind. Yep. I'll tell you how you work out uh, solos in particular by ear. You do it the same way that I used to have to memorize lyrics when in the 90s before the internet, yeah. before everything was Googleable. You listen to the first word or the first line or as much as you could remember. You pause the tape or the CD and then you wrote it down. And then if you were doing that on guitar, you pause it, freeze it in your mind and try and, and figure, figure it out. Exactly. If you're in the wrong position or anything, don't worry about it. Try and get exactly. the notes right. If there are pieces of software, I think there's one called Transcribe. There are plenty of software. You can even s slow things down on YouTube these days. So being able to make it slow enough so that you can hear each individual pitch, each mm -hmm. note and find it can be done. Although does the YouTube thing just as quick does that, I think that might change the pitch. No, it doesn't at all. It does not. Uh, it's fantastic. Oh, 0.75 on the settings. Yeah. 
you can you can speed it up if you want as well, but slow sure things down to 0.75. And doesn't change the pitch. It doesn't change. It's oh, a fantastic great. learning great. tool, and it's just kind of down there or something. Yeah. So if you want to hear us speak really slowly, we will speak really slowly. <laughs> but then the second line or the second phrase yeah. or the second lick, do it again. Oh, Even click um, on YouTube. Just click the backward arrow on your keyboard, and it will whiz back five mm -hmm. seconds. That's a good, a decent amount of time to be trying to work out at any one time, mm -hmm. and choose an easy. If and you've never done this one. before, choose an easy one first. Don't yeah. start with the dream solo that's all twiddly widdly. If you can't play anything to that speed, your fingers tend to move about as fast, in my experience, as your mind can kind of cope with. Yes, your fingers are held back with how many notes you can keep in your mind and and hear the different pictures of. Mm -hmm. Um, so I think that's a really key thing. Your ear training will probably increase pretty naturally with the, your lead guitar ability, but you need to keep on top of it as yeah. well. Learning about intervals, which comes back to the major scale harmony, yeah, the which is stuff. born out of diatonic. Same points it does, it does come back. There's been such a range of questions in this episode, but it basically comes back to um, learn about rhythms and how yeah. they're written and how they work with bars and beats for different time signatures as well, not just 4-4, four, four, with 3-4, with 12-8 uh, yeah. or any, you know, any, anything that comes up. Um, learn basic diatonic theory, um, what chords are in a key, what scale goes over, works over the top of that and this idea of musical keys and diatonic chords. Mm -hmm. And then learn what all that diatonic chord stuff and major scale stuff sounds like. Be able yeah. to identify it by ear. You get those three things, it will answer all the questions before you yeah. even think of them. You, you will have that instinct trained to be a real musician and kind of, uh, you, you know, be ahead of the game. Be able to mm -hmm. just work it out quite naturally. So that's it for this episode. Thank you so much to you guys for watching. Thank you to Chris for reading out the questions. Uh, we'll get him involved in future episodes for sure. Um, thank you as again for, for you guys for watching. Please subscribe to both the Andy Guitar and the Your Guitar Academy uh, YouTube channels because we're going between the channels for each of these episodes. I hope you found this useful. Any more questions or anything this has made you now think of, ask it in the comments and we will help you out all we can. We're going to play you out with a little jam now, but we hope to see you in another episode of another guitar show. These are going live every Sunday. Bye for now.